Once you reach a few reps away from failure and the set starts to fight back, you guys know what I mean, it starts to feel tough, then you pull the pin and the grenade, then that reminder of what to think about, you hit, and you release the beast. Then you're psyched up, and this should take you through the last two to five repetitions. Mission accomplished, you did it. Hey folks, Dr. Mike here for RP Strength. Today's video topic is about psyching up for muscle growth training, and buckle up, it's gonna be a deep dive into the dark side and the light side but a lot of dark side type of stuff. In any case, if you're new to the channel, I have been a professor of sport and exercise science for a long time, a competitive bodybuilder, a competitive Brazilian Jiu Jitsu grappler. Uh, apparently I know some things, not too many things, but one of them is about how to psych up for muscle growth training. Deep dive. So let's start at the beginning and define what psyching up is. Technically, technically speaking, it's labeled as the creation of psychological arousal. Now I know, tee hee, arousal. But arousal doesn't just mean sexual arousal, which is what you fucking perverts are thinking. Arousal means how active is your nervous system? How awake are you? And if you are more awake and more apt to provide lots of stimulus, then you get more growth. The reason we might want to psych up, or rather increase our psychological arousal, is because one of the side effects of increasing psychological arousal is a potential for an increased neural drive to the target muscles, thus being able to push them closer to their limits. As you push a muscle closer and closer to its limits, it turns on more and more of its largest, fastest twitch motor units. What does that mean? These motor units, a motor unit is the nerve that comes out of the spinal cord and all of the muscle cells that it innervates and thus activates. Every single muscle you have is composed of, well, usually thousands or hundreds of thousands of motor units, and each nerve controls some grouping of muscles. It is pretty much always true that each nerve controls only a single fiber type of muscle. Some nerves, the smaller motor units, are usually the ones that control slower twitch muscles. In just a few muscle cells, you use your small motor units to do things like this, to move your hand around. Like if you're grabbing something really delicate, you're not gonna go and activate all the gigantic parts of your whole forearm muscle, just the little teeny ones. These are slower twitch muscles. Every single nerve that's being activated only uh, activates a few muscle cells. It's exactly to produce very little force. In training, we have another objective, however, and that's why when we psychologically arouse ourselves and we try really hard in training, we activate the biggest motor units. They're the ones that have the largest fraction of muscle under their control. So it's a stepwise function when your muscle activates motor units and the steps get bigger as you go. So uh, at first you activate some motor units that are small and each new motor unit contributes a little bit of force. But as you go and activate the bigger and bigger and bigger motor units, it's more total muscle that's being activated every time, so the steps get bigger. And that last step to activate everything could be a lot of muscle you just typically are not even turning on. Now it's on, and that's good. Because it's on, it's going to be active, it's going to produce active tension, it's going to produce metabolites, and it's probably going to grow much more than if it's turned off. Pretty straightforward. And interestingly enough, these larger motor units are more likely to be the faster twitch muscles. And remember, faster twitch muscles generally grow more rapidly and grow bigger than the slower twitch muscle fibers. So that's another big win. And because of this kind of, it activates even more muscle, the muscle is even more fast twitch, and it grows more muscle overall. Yeah, trying hard can really make a difference between how much muscle you grow versus if you don't try hard, you could grow significantly less. So Psyching up, creating psychological arousal is definitely a pathway to better gains if that's a limiting factor for you, 100%. So let's talk about psyching up from an upsides and downsides perspective. If you've been watching this channel long enough, you know, every good thing has uh, negatives and a lot of bad things have positives as well. So the upsides of psyching up is that you can push harder, making sure that you enhance the growth stimulus, which means more muscle growth for you. That's sweet. But also, as far as discovering what limiting factors you have in your muscle growth journey, psyching up can rule out not going hard enough as a troubleshooting variable. If you're getting every little last ounce of juice out of your muscles, 
and then you're not growing like you want, it's probably recovery or diet that's doing the not growing. It's probably not that you're not training hard enough. So that's really nice to know. If you never psych up, if you never push it hard, someone could say, well, maybe you're not growing because you're not pushing it hard. You'd have to admit maybe they're correct. There are downsides of psyching up, which was why I do it incredibly rarely nowadays. Psyching up creates tons of fatigue that accumulates over the course of your muscle cycle and screws you up. It creates psychological fatigue. It creates neural fatigue. Your nervous system actually frays and needs to be repaired. That can take a while. It creates muscular fatigue because you push your muscles so far and even hormonal fatigue. If you psych up all the time, your levels of stress hormones go up and your levels of anabolic hormones like testosterone go down over time and that's just no good for training results. It's like uh, almost in a state of being in permanent conflict or the hunter-gatherer societies we evolved in like uh, too much psyching up and you're kind of just on edge all the time and that's absolutely not good for muscle. Remember, muscles grow when the parasympathetic state of the nervous system is activated, which is the recovery relaxation state, not the fight or flight state. So there is so much pulling on the fight or flight trigger that you overdo it 100%. And put in more technical terms, the stimulus to fatigue ratio of psyching up is often low. Not always, but often. So we can tentatively rule out constant psyching up for every single set as a wise practice in most cases. And that's probably not a good idea. So automatically, I want you guys to contextualize the rest of this conversation as it's going to be cool. We're going to learn about how to psych up, the different pathways to psyching up really well, the effects, the downsides. This is probably not something you're going to be doing all the time, just something you do sparingly. So to that end, we have a list of when it's best to avoid psyching up, situations in which it's best to avoid psyching up, and a list of situations in which psyching up could be worth a try and might have some positive outcomes. When is best to avoid psyching up? A couple of things. First, for already gifted muscle groups that respond well. If your triceps are the biggest muscle on your fucking body relative to the others and nothing, you do bicep curls and your triceps get bigger, you do not need to psych up for triceps. That's just a very poor use of your mental energy. Next, if you're psyching up in every set or even most sets of a high volume program, you're probably accumulating way too much fatigue. It's probably a bad idea. If you're psyching up at the uh, beginning of a mesocycle or even towards the middle, anything but the end of a mesocycle, it's not insanely wise. I see people like day one in the gym and they're screaming with a fucking bench press bar crushing them. And you're like, I don't, you're going to sustain that intensity for the next six weeks, man. Maybe. But if you didn't go that intense, you could just get better progress for the next six weeks. So probably something to save for later. A non-starter for psyching up is when you have bad technique. And I want to be very, very, very clear about that. If you're deadlifting, you're going through a religious experience and your back looks like a fucking question mark and your hips shoot up really fast. And then you're in that like almost isometric, just above knee position and your spine is uncurling itself and you don't feel your hamstrings anymore, or just pain shooting down your legs because three vertebrae shot into your spine. Like that's not going to work. The probability that you get hurt is exponentially higher if you psych up with bad technique. And the problem is you may not be hitting the muscles you want to hit at that point anymore. If you're squatting, you can start to do good mornings with the squats more than squats. You still hit parallel, still come back up, but now you're not even using your quads a lot because you got so busy psyching up to try to get the reps that the rep quality just declined like crazy. And then that's just absolutely not good. So when your technique is bad, it's a non-starter, which means TLDR for the last slide we'll talk about here is if you're a beginner, don't even worry about psyching up because you're not qualified for it. It's almost like who gets to use the NAS and the fucking the racing nitrous in the vehicle? Well, it's if your first several days of driving don't hit the NAS, bad idea. You're going to crash. If you're an expert racer, hey, there's times to hit the NAS and, you know, Vin Diesel and Toretto and family. Scott, what else do we know about uh, that sort of thing? It's not how you stand by your car. It's how you drive it. It's how you drive it. Toretto. It's actually Tim McInnes, one of uh, my friends from grad school. He has a PhD in, in sports science as well. He had the best Toretto impression ever. You have to like, I'm not fat enough to do it anymore. You got to have chin meat coming out because you know how he kind of does that, Scott? Dom Toretto. <sighs> so good. In any case, lastly, when you're an advanced, strong, dedicated hypertrophy trainee, and you're doing compound movements for sets of five to 10, psyching up is probably a bad idea, especially when you're closer to a contest, especially when you're on lots of gear, because that's a really good way to get hurt. So these are bad ideas for psyching up. Now, when can you give psyching up a try? Well, when a few things are occurring. One is when you're developmentally mature enough, and I mean in 
in sport, in training, not in overall development. You're developmentally mature enough to hold excellent technique through psyched up reps. If you can psych up and lose your fucking mind and still bench press in a straight line, hey, all right, you're a candidate. If not, you need to work on your technique more. Next, some muscles you struggle to stimulate. They don't get tired. They don't get sore. The mind muscle connection sucks. You don't know what the fuck is going on. Do I even have hamstrings? How the fuck is this working? Make sure you do enough volume first. Because if you're doing one or two sets of hams, no amount of psyching up might give you the growth that you would from four or five sets. But if the volume is there and you're still, you still feel like there's just juice left to be squeezed out of certain muscle that you're struggling with, psyching up is a fine idea there. And then it makes sense. It's worth paying the cost because that lagging muscle gets to be brought up as opposed to your triceps are the best and your psych up for triceps are just the best, best. Next, this is a real big one. You might not like hearing it. It's worth psyching up and I'll get to this later at some point during, not before, but during a high rep sets, sets of 20 to 30 reps. Remember, those are effective for hypertrophy. And especially if you're on a machine and maintaining good technique is easier, it actually matters how hard you push because a lot of people will give up on a set of 30 at about 25 reps just because of the pain and the exhaustion. If they psyched up properly around that time, they could get 30 reps, they could get 32 reps. And that's five to seven of the most hypertrophic reps of that set that you now gain. A lot of people will say, you know, training to failure is unrealistic at high reps because it's so difficult. If you can psych up properly, now it's not as difficult. Now it's possible, and now maybe you can get some traction with it. Now, I'm not recommending that you go and do high reps and psych up for it. But if you're going to do high reps and you want the most out of these sets because it's a lagging muscle and you typically quit early because you just don't want the pain, psyching up becomes a really viable strategy. Might be a wise idea to psych up on the last set of a whole session of training, you know, one last set of bicep curls, and then you hit the showers, fellas. Great. Fucking lose your mind. No problem. Very, very small downside, decent upside. On the last week of a whole mesocycle of training, and even, even better, the last half week. So let's say four. Thursday, Friday, Saturday is your last three day, tra- uh, days of training in a whole program before deload. Man, you, you can just, you can uncork the shit at that point. Yeah, you're going to get more fatigued, but the deload should be able to handle that, no problem. And then so if you do want to psych up, if for other reasons it's compelling to do so, at the end of a mesocycle is a fairly, fairly good place, probably the best place. Now, I said if there's a compelling reason, so here's the last point on this little section. You never have to psych up. Just doing more sets gives you the same hypertrophy as psyching up for fewer sets, as far as we can tell, with probably very few exceptions. But you can if you'd like, because it can be an effective stimulus for muscle growth and also because it's fun. So if you really like psyching up, strategic psyching up, as described here, might be valuable to you. But if you think you're missing out on something because you don't psych up, as long as you're getting pretty good gains, that's probably not the rock to turn over to expect to find miracle gains underneath. Now, let's talk about timing the psych up because a lot of people get this wrong. I sure did for a fucking large fraction of my life. Psyching up right before a one or two or three RM attempt can work great. That's because most arousal at its peak fades out in, oh, 10 or 15 seconds or something. And that's how long that takes. But if you're doing a set of 15 reps, psyching up at the beginning will give you tons of mental energy to do the first five reps, but those are the five easiest reps. You don't need the psych up for them. And because psyching up has kind of an adrenaline dump effect where right after you tend to feel pretty exhausted, you don't want to feel very exhausted on rep number seven of a set of 15. That'd be a fucking disaster. And I've seen that happen, bro. I've seen guys go into high rep squats. They make a fucking, you know, clown show at the gym. No worries. That's what the gym is there for. No judgment. Fucking staple their belt on, scream a few times. Their friends get rowdy. And then that first rep, just to fucking just balloon that shit off the ground. Rocket ride. Second rep, rocket ride. Third rep, scream, rocket ride. You can tell right around rep six or seven, they slow down. They're like, like they, let one, they let one out. He's like, <sighs> and you realize they're thinking, holy shit, I'm out of brain juice. And I have eight more reps to do. I fucked this up. 
Here's a, a really quick analogy, very, very similar, barely an analogy. Um, you don't sprint out of a fucking marathon starting line. Don't psych up at the beginning of a high rep set. Any set for hypertrophy, anything north of five reps is considered a good set for hypertrophy. Any hypertrophy set, you don't want to psych up right before the set. Now, there's a difference in getting serious, getting your mind right, saying a couple of good things to yourself, laser vision, that's all good. But true psyching up, which we'll talk about in a little bit, don't do that at the beginning of your set. Do it at the end of your set when you need it. The worst idea in this regard, which I've done plenty of times, is to psych up before the gym. Lots of people will put in that headphones for the walk or the drive to the gym. They'll blast metal. They'll blast gangster rap. Scott, what's the music that really gets you going? New metal. Are you serious? And new metal. You're kidding. Love it. Jesus, Caucasian Christ. <laughs> Well, there you go. New metal, whatever it is that, that, that you know, for me, it's Cardi B. I'm only half kidding. Dude, her shit is fire though. Like, yeah, she's ratchet as fuck, but a bitch can sing. And by sing, I mean, I don't know, make those weird noises. I love that fucking bitch. In any case, psyching up before the gym is a phenomenally bad idea. Why? Because, and this is a stupid nonsense term, but it reflects a real thing in the world. I'll call it psychic energy, mental energy. You can get drained of that mental energy, and then you have less of it for the workout to stimulate valuable actual growth with, and you put yourself into a shitty spot. Uh, people call this sometimes psyching yourself out. Like, I psyched up, and then I'm psyched out. I got nothing left. People, big, strong people will do this. They'll listen to fucking tunes on the way to the gym. They'll listen to headphones, you know, while they're tying their shoes to begin to squat, blah, blah, blah. And you want to like, you know, you want to be like the big strong people. And you're like, I'm going to do that. Don't do it. It's a mistake when they're doing it. Then they're not doing it because it's effective or they've reasoned their way to it. They're doing it because they like the feeling of power, not because they need to psych up 30 fucking minutes before your first squat warm up set. It's fun to feel your swag. Right? When you're listening to DMX just driving to fucking grandma's house on Saturday to see grandma. You're not like getting ready to fight grandma at the house. I, mean, I don't know what kind of relationship you have with your grandparents. Maybe you are, but it's just fire shit to listen to DMX say things that in today's world would, gee whiz, Scott, would DMX get a record deal with this kind of shit he used to say? Oh boy, I think he's canceled. I'm pretty sure he's posthumously canceled. So, you know, it's cool to feel strong and powerful and get that fucking rage in you. But if you don't use it right away for getting more reps, then you're just fatiguing yourself for no reason and you're running your well dry, which is something we'll talk about in a little bit. So those are bad ideas for psyching up as far as timing. Now, a better idea for the timing of the psych up is to stay as relaxed as possible before the gym. Remember, you have a certain amount of psych up energy in you in any one given unit of time, and it does refresh and rebuild, but that refreshing rebuilding Takes minutes, hours, and days if you really go to that well. So stay as relaxed as you can before the gym. And really, actually, this is a really good uh, point for all of training and preparation and recovery. You just stay as relaxed as you can all the time. That's a really good idea. It's going to make you live longer. You like your life better. And you sure should have more energy in the tank when it comes time to do major warfare in the gym. During your warm-ups, turn that re relaxation and that nonchalant attitude into athleticism. Athletes aren't screaming at the top of their lungs all the time. They're just focused and they're feeling their flow, which is what you should be doing as you're warming up, which is awesome. It gets you one step of the way closer to a psych up, but without draining any energy. For most of your working sets, be athletic, but not psychotic. There's going to be a time for psychotic. Don't worry. And then between sets, relax as much as possible. Again, arousal is a limited resource that takes days to recharge, so you have to be judicious with it. There's always the people that jam to their fucking tunes between sets. And to be completely honest, man, from an ideal perspective of tailoring your psych up to best performance, that's unwise. Now, there's different kinds of music. Sometimes you just put in your music that just gives you the overall flow, but it doesn't make you want to break shit in half right away. That's totally cool to listen to between sets. But that one riff, that fucking, what is that? The first like 30 seconds of Bomb Track by Rage Against the Machine from their initial album you got to save that for when it matters. I just wouldn't listen to that all the fucking time. Now, before your big sets on which you choose to psych up, you guys ready for this one? Don't psych up 
not before the sets. It's not time yet. Just be athletic, but quickly before the set starts, without emotional buy-in, without starting to feel those emotions, know logically what you're going to think about when you need to psych up later to flip that switch. Have that thought in mind. This is the place I'm going to go to with my mind when this set gets really tough. That means you don't go there right away before you put your belt on or as you put your belt on or as you unrack the hack squat. Don't go there. But before you do anything, right when you're sitting in your chair or just standing around before you do that set of 15 on the hack squat, before you start putting on your belt or even during, note to yourself, okay, this is the thing I'm going to when I need help later in the set. And remember that. You won't forget it. You'll know what it is. But don't start thinking about it right then and there, right? Um, I always had a variety of analogies, but uh, all of them are insanely politically incorrect and just downright sexual in nature. I'm just not going to say them. But in any case, you know what I mean. Essentially, you want to have the gun of psyching up cocked and loaded, but you don't fire. Not yet. Here's the deal. Once you reach a few reps away from failure and the set starts to fight back, you guys know what I mean. It starts to feel tough, heavy, painful, burning, get me the fuck out of here, I can't breathe, that whole bullshit. Then you pull the pin and the grenade. Then that reminder of what to think about, you hit. And you release the beast. Then you're psyched up. And this should take you through the last two to five repetitions. Mission accomplished. You did it. So that's the timing of the psych up. Let's talk about the magnitude of a good psych up. How powerful does it have to be? The thing here is it just needs to be tailored to the number of remaining reps you have to do for which you need the psych up. For example, if you have another rep of bench to grind through, you don't have to psych up much, man. Last Second to last rep is pretty slow. Last one, get your, get your head right, just fucking go. That's it. That's it. No need to think about fucking dad beating your ass when you were younger. Not that I'm thinking about that. Well, maybe I am. Uh, none of that crazy shit. You just think the task isn't that big, right? It's like, uh, you know, imagine you were like hanging out with Vegeta and he was your best friend from Dragon Ball Z. And like you went to a party and one of your old high school bullies, he's like, hey, you little bitch, you doing it at my party. You're like, Vegeta, handle it. And he goes like this and his blast just destroys so much of the North American continent and a piece of the moon that the oceans flow into the rest. And we've killed like 500 million people and disrupted the world economy. And by the way, you and everyone, you know, from 200 miles back this way gets sucked into the blast zone. Like, ugh. Vegeta, you could have just stared him down, bro. Why? It's overkill is a thing for sure. Now, on the other hand, if you have another five reps of mile rep hack squats and you're on that five second break <gasps> before you got to get another five reps, yeah, you got to dig deep as fuck. And it might take a really gnarly psych up to carry you all the way through. If you psych up more than you estimated would require to get the task done, you're just kind of burning more psychic energy than you need to. And you just, it's fun, but it just adds extra fatigue. Now, on the other hand, not psyching up enough means you underperform. So there's an art here. And it's okay to go a little bit harder than you think you need to. So if you have another rep of the bench, you can go a little bit harder to give yourself two reps worth of psych up and stop after one. But just a little bit of a margin is very different than, you know, destroying half of the North American continent or whatever the fuck. Now, here begins the rest of this talk, more, more or less. And that's in the what to think about strategy. This whole time we're talking about psych ups. We haven't really talked about what to think when it's time to psych up because that's the real thing, right? If someone doesn't know what psyching up is, you could have just uh, explained to them dynamics. Oh, that makes sense. They're like, okay, go psych up. They're like, ooh. I don't, I don't know. Am I supposed to be angry? Am I supposed to hate someone? Is it like, do I feel powerful? I don't understand what's going on. All of us have a bit of intuition, some many a years and experiences of intuition about this, but I'm just going to kind of lay out what I think is going on. And there's definitely stuff going on that I haven't accounted for. I could be not super correct about some of the stuff, but I think there's going to be a little bit of wisdom, a little bit of value you can take away from what I'm going to say. There are many, 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 many ways to psych up. And I'm not here to be the final arbiter on all of them. I don't even know fucking half. But I'd say the vast majority in my experience is split into two major categories. 
There's negative mental energy psych up and there's positive mental energy psych up. We're going to go through both. of them, And each one has some subcategories as well. Negative energy has many, many, many forms, good God, including Darth Vader, I guess. But at least two common ones that I've seen myself and other people talk about or go to the well often with for psyching up. And those two are doubt and revenge. Okay, this is getting real deep. I told you, motherfuckers, this show is going to be deep as fuck. Doubt is when you surface thoughts at the time of the psych up, something to the effect of, do not fucking bet against me. I've been underestimated long enough. No more. Do not fucking doubt me. Who are you talking to in this case? Nobody. Your fifth grade bully's dead of drugs by now, no doubt, or has five children and he's miserable and thinking about being dead of drugs. There's no one that's doubting you. I'm sure shit, not in the gym. It's something you say to yourself. I've actually seen people scream this shit out loud before. And then you're like, okay, I'm just going to, that guy's a school shooter. I'm going to take myself the fuck up out of here. But that's a real emotion you have to connect with and feel at the time of the psych up is to feel doubted by just doubt it, the grand scheme. And to feel that you are going to unequivocally prove that anyone who doubted you and made a fucking big mistake, you're going to prove them wrong. It doesn't take a lot of thinking, just a lot of feeling to call this on. So it's not very intellectual and uh, it's easy to call on with minimal thought for that reason. And it yields a solid boost for many people. But the issue with calling upon sort of doubt breaking is that over weeks and for some people months and for other people years of calling on that doubt, the uh, amount of mental energy and psych up you get out of that starts to fade away because you start to build self-confidence. To be completely honest with you guys, I can pretend and sort of feel like channeling doubt. I might be able to flip that switch, but when I was younger, I could do it a lot better. Nowadays, like, I'm pretty confident in myself, not in like a, a high key, like, I'm the fuck, yeah, I'm the fucking man, whoa, I'm not in a New Jersey way, but in a way of like, oh, so I feel pretty capable. And uh, if I was to say, oh man, like, it, it'd be kind of weird, like if, if if Scott, the video guy, was like filming me on fucking, you know, camera training, and like as I'm stapling my belt before the hack squad, I turn to Scott and I'm like, motherfuckers out there doubting me, right, Scott? He'd be like, what? No one, what? Who? Who doubted you? Who hurt you? Is that even is that even true anymore? So the more you are able to be successful in training, the less the doubt thing is going to make any sense to you internally. And then you won't be able to be real with it. You, you can't fake love, you know? Sure, not in your own heart. And then you can't really fake like real anger about people doubting you. You run out of that. Now, the really good thing is this functions as excellent therapy. That's why a lot of us are in the gym. That may be why you're in the gym. It's amazing to live out your anger at doubts and to do something about it, to fix it. And you're not fixing the actual doubts that people ever told you in your life. You're not going to become shit, young man, quote, my grandpa, no, and my dad and my brother. Uh, but you will be able to succeed at proving the haters wrong in your own mind with every rep and set that you do that's a success. You do that for long enough, you can't fake the shit anymore. It's unreal therapy for you because you've felt success in your heart many, many times when buttressing up against challenges. That does incredible things for you therapeutically. It will change you for the better. It will make you more confident, more capable, and feel less doubted, which is awesome. You're psychologically healthier after years of the shit, for real. But you can't really go to that well anymore because it's fucking mostly dry. Like someone's like, man, think about all the people that hurt you. And you're like, I don't even mind saying people are pretty good to me. I don't remember any people hurting me. And in childhood, I barely fucking remember that at all. I kind of just feel pretty good. Then it doesn't work anymore. Then you might have to try some other shit. We'll get to what you have to try in a bit. Another way to go about negative energy psyching up is a still darker form. And that's revenge. Oh, that's right. The old revenge fantasy, which I always thought was sexual, but I guess it's just like a, like a murder mystery. Fuck if I know. Scott, what does revenge fantasy mean to you? Scott's going to sit this one out. He's like thinking of like 80 people he'd love to fucking toast. He's like, nah, 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 nah. I'm not going to say that. Yeah. Full of love. Scott has been diagnosed as medically too full of love and he needs his love drained by medical professionals every Tuesday. So... If you want to use revenge, here's how you go about it. 
You think of a time in your life, preferably a real time, when you were wronged. And you right now, and this is going to sound really funny because it is, in these last four reps of leg press, you're going to take back what's yours and make things right by force. This is a huge potential for arousal if you felt wronged in your life before and you took it personally. I will say it is insanely fatiguing. It's an emotional experience and thus has a rapidly, also has a rapidly drying well. You can only get pissed at people uh, for long enough in your past until you're like, eh, I've lived out that fantasy enough. I don't really give a shit. No worries. So if you go to the swell too much, one of two things may happen. One, you'll either run it dry and there'll be nothing there, or you get really good at being vengeful, and then you're just living in a negative headspace all the time. Of all of the thoughts you would like to have more of, if you were sitting with God by your side, designing your All of your thoughts for the whole future of your entire life until you birth to death, I highly recommend you pick as little thoughts of vengeance as possible because they're very bad for you in the sense of very bad time experiencing them. It can be liberating and freeing for a few seconds at a time. If you get too used to it, you kind of always think about it, and it really is a huge drag. Like vengeance attitude hurts you and no one else, and it really is true. Then lifting isn't as fun anymore. You've colored lifting into this dark hell hole and all of a sudden you're getting tattoos and piercings and wearing all kinds of outfits. Like if you're female, what up? <laughs> Boy's still out here, baby. JK, I'm married. Fuck off. But uh, Jared Feather may be single, but you're probably Caucasian if you do that shit. So no need to apply. He can't actually see you. Lifting isn't fun anymore. That's fucking weird. If you have some demons, that need therapy and their revenge demons, this is a really good use of your time in the gym and can fucking work really well. Now, here's the trick. I highly recommend that you be mindful and that right after the set is over, you rack the deadlift, you got to flip back to I'm cool with everyone mode on purpose. You don't want to take seriously any of the thoughts you had on the last two reps of high rep deadlifting. These are thoughts that are going to hurt you a lot and hurt no one else unless you plan on actually carrying them out and then you're going to go to jail for a long time and we don't need you in our fucking society anymore. You don't want vengeance to poison your mind for too long, especially if you take it seriously. So if you're going to go to revenge, as soon as the set is over, flip the script consciously of JK, all is well, all is good. You'll have a much better time that way. All right, that's negative energy. Then there's positive energy. It has many forms, at least two that I can speak to myself personally. Maybe in the comments you want to share a, a few other ones. Goku Spirit Bomb from Dragon Ball Z. No, wait, wait, wrong kind of energy. But similar. There are two forms, and I call them frames because it's a frame of thinking about situation, the thing. There's the capability frame and uh, what I call the desire frame, or maybe a better term for it is the Icarus frame. And Icarus was the uh, gentleman who, I guess, pasted paper mache wings on his wings and flew so close to the sun that they melted the wax and he fell to his death, flew flew too close to the sun. That'll make sense in a little bit why I say that. But gee whiz, the ancestral Greeks had a dog shit understanding of aerodynamics and lift and how close the sun really was to us. Capability frame. Let's talk about that first. What you want to think of in this positive frame for psyching up are affirming thoughts that remind you how fucking baller you really are. A thought you can play with is, dude, I'm overqualified for this shit. The fuck out of my face. What are you kidding me? Six plates? Fuck you. This shit is so easy for me, bro. Another simple one is I can do this. Whatever words you tell yourself in your head, you have to fully believe you are going to get every single rep. You believe in yourself because you're so goddamn strong. And if you really feel like that, Man, that's a huge help. If you push this enough and you're really good at that meditative mind state, you can get to a place where you essentially feel so much power emanating from you. Like you can, you feel like you can barely control yourself lest you rip a fucking hole in the space time continuum. Like, man, you're feeling your swag times a million. In order to pull this off, you need a lot of self efficacy, like for real. You can't fake surface pretend the shit. If you're saying to yourself, yeah, no, I'm strong. I'm strong. I can do this. I can do this. 
Everyone around can tell you don't fucking believe it because you don't fucking believe it. You got to be able to believe this. And in order to believe this, you have to have a little bit of self-efficacy, a belief that you are a person that can do things, that you are successful, that you can have effect on the world and win. If you don't have a lot of history of winning or having effect on the world or being the man in your own brain or really in society, uh, maybe this frame doesn't work so well for you. But don't worry. It will at some point when you get through all your therapy going through the bad shit, which I'll get to in a little bit. So you it does take some de decent self-efficacy to pull off. Uh, you actually have to work into feeling powerful for it to work, which is fucking sweet. Now, this might not come to you super easily. It can take some practice, even some kind of visualization exercises in your free time. Do not do these before you go to bed. You won't be falling asleep for a while. And it does and it can yield amazing abilities. It's also super fun. It's really addictive to feel your own swag. You tell yourself in that last three reps of overhead press that you are a fucking juggernaut. And then you fucking knock out four reps. You rack that shit. I like legitimately feel the machines next to me in the gym, like running from me, pulsing, scared. It's a fucking gnarly feeling. And if you only deploy it when you need it, strategically, like we talked about earlier in this chat, it really doesn't run dry, which is fucking sweet. And because it's a capability frame and you work on it all the time and you practice it, it can actually make the well bigger. It used to take you a lot of woosahing to be like, I really believe in myself. But after you've done it for a while and you've had a lot of success in the gym, when someone's like, you think you're getting this way, you're like, oh, fuck, are you fucking kidding me, bro? Watch this, right? It's just right there. Instant belief in self. Like imagine being like an undefeated heavyweight champion of the world and some dude at a bar fight's like, better, better watch your step, bro. And be like, I'm sorry, what? Let me turn my back to you. So free hit, right? That's how it can feel, which is really sweet. And for those of us, not pointing anyone out here, that maybe didn't always feel powerful in our childhoods and lives, but maybe wanted a little bit taste that medicine, it's incredible, incredible therapy. It will actually boost your confidence, and that confidence will spill over into the rest of your life. You can't just have your gym swag at a 1,000, and as soon as you walk into the parking lot and you see a hot girl, you're like, oh, 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 my lady. At first, it's like that, but afterwards, you're like, what's up? And she's like, damn, what's up, big homie? You like, just call me big homie. And she's like, oh, yeah. And you're like, are you, are you a appropriating a dialect that is not for your people. And she's like, oh my God, I'm so sorry. And then you get that pity pussy. Scott, can we print that or no? No. Yeah. And maybe it'll work. <laughs> pee pee. Don't just take out your pee pee though, outside of a gym. I've done that. And my parole officer says, it's going to cost you more community service. He always says the same goddamn thing. I don't even know why I pay him. No, no, wait, the state mandates me to see him. This is really, really good stuff. As soon as you're done with that set, let yourself ease back into calm. And if you just relax, it all kind of goes away. Now, it is tempting to scream and stare people down and talk to random people afterwards. Yes, it might be a thing. You guys have seen like people rack the squat. It is fucking one of my one of my friends and training partners, uh, Dr. Jared Skinner, PhD, actually, not Feather Skinner, different guy. Um, he fucking hit a PR squad at a meet. And as soon as he racked it, he walked off and he's like, get off me. <laughs> he's just screaming into the ether. And people are like, was, was he talking to me? Like, it's awesome to feel that fucking vibe of power. And generally speaking, the gym members and the manager, not so cool with you just screaming at random people. So easy, ease it in. But it, this is something you can go to all the time. Aha. Uh -huh. And now we get to our last frame. So this is the fourth way of psyching up. It's the second positive way of psyching up. If you guys think shit is getting real deep so far, holy fucking shit, shit's about to get deeper. This is the desire slash Icarus frame flying into the sun. What does that mean? Here we go. Here's the race for some fucking poetry for you motherfuckers. Maximum, we want you to visualize the following. Just like loose eye in your house if you're fucking alone, just close your eyes. If you're around other people, never trust nobody. Shit. Maximum muscle growth. I want you to visualize it as a pinhole of light kind of off in the distance. But it's not visible light. It's not spectral light. It's the light of physical pain deep in the belly of your muscles. And what you want to do is get into the mentality of letting yourself be pulled into the light. 
into the maximum pain. Because we know that during a set, as the reps progress, the more pain you have in the muscle, not the joints, should be able to tell, the more growth you're in for. I mean, the metabolites cause pain, the tension causes pain, everything causes fucking pain. Pain is good. Pain is what you want in your belly of your muscles when you are doing a set at the very end, especially. The more you go to the pain, the more you're going to growth. I've done this more than a handful of times, and I've sometimes actually laughed out loud at the end of a high rep set because of the joy of embracing pain, pain that is now your friend, pain that is now your guiding light. And used to be when you get hit with pain in the set, you, you want to recoil away from it. Now, if you successfully flip to this mindset, which is difficult to do, I'll talk about that in a little bit, you reframe as pain is your friend. You want more of this. You hope to God there's more pain for you to uncover. This is tough to pull off and requires a lot of practice. What is often a good idea is to start out with capability framing. Tell yourself you're the fucking man. Convince it. Believe it. Once you're adept at capability framing, then off of that very high pedestal, you might be able to step into the Icarus framing. This is not for everyone. Then you might reframe for desire. So ideally, if we were all meditative monks, we would just go straight to the desire frame. We would love every part of pain in the gym. And then look, when you love the pain and pain is the thing that causes you growth, man, like it's not really a challenge anymore. You know, like I'm going to say something really fucking stupid, but I probably shouldn't say on YouTube, but like, you know what I'm saying? This guy, the video guy's already sighing. He's like, Jesus Christ. When you're like, you know what I'm saying, having a good time with another consenting adult and things are happening that are, well, let's say for adults, when you're getting closer to nutting, let's just say that, you're not exactly like, uh-oh, I better finish strong. Like, oh, what do I have to tell myself? No. You're like, I, more please, more of this please. If you can feel pain in the gym in a similar light of wanting it, holy fuck, you have the whole training problem completely solved. But not all of us are ready to go to that place right away. Realistically, for most people, a baseline of ability framing, believing in yourself, the positive stuff, is probably needed before some of us can go to that desire frame. But for some of us who have been hurt a little bit deeply by life, we need some serious gym therapy too. If you're in that cohort of people that I still got some negative shit in my soul I need out in the gym. I want to take you on a quick guided tour of the psych up therapy journey, which is going to integrate every component of what we talked about in one individual's path to enlightenment, which is really just getting bigger quads. But I submit to you, is that not the same thing? So the psych up therapy journey, you can begin with revenge framing. But at some point, you'll have a lot of sets of vengeance under your belt. You feel like you've avenged a bunch of stuff. And your desire for vengeance is just going to reduce over the, depending on who you are, days, weeks, months, or years. And you kind of feel like you've taken all the vengeance that you've needed. You know, like imagine, imagine um, Scott, what's that motherfucker name that went to go get his daughter in Europe and shit? Liam Neeson. Taken. taken. Imagine you know, like I'm taken eight, right? And they call him up. They're like, Liam. He's like, yeah, what? Like. We have your chipmunk that your daughter has as a bet. He was like, I don't give a fuck, man. You do whatever the fuck you want with that chipmunk. I've been out there. I've avenged enough, man. I, enough. But like Liam Neeson, you now feel more confident because you've gone through that therapeutic work. When you're more confident, you have something to, something to rest yourself on. When you only want revenge, people can be feel free to doubt you and to prove them wrong. You need, you need revenge. Now that you have a bit more confidence, you can transition less into revenge framing and more into doubt framing. So we'll go revenge framing, then doubt framing. The confidence of having defeated, so to speak, so many prior sets with a vengeance frame is going to be high. You're a person that delivers. You are not to be fucked with. And now you know that. When you're a person who has been wronged by everyone and you're like, don't fucking doubt me. People could be like, why not, pussy? Everyone else fucked you up. When you're a person who has taken brutal, bloody revenge, so to speak, on all of your reps and sets, doubting you is a big fucking problem. And now you can say, and here's the big part, believe in your heart 
that you are not to be doubted and fucked with. You're just ripe for the doubt frame. You have the confidence. Now, the reps or the weights or the machine or whatever, the exercise would have to be crazy to doubt you. And you're going to show those reps why with the doubt frame. Big mistake. Eventually, after, well, depending on who you are, weeks, months, or years, decades in some cases, ugh, JK, it didn't last decades, but definitely years, eventually you just won't feel very doubted anymore. It'll be inorganic for you to try to bring it up with people like, dude, don't let people doubt you. I'm like, I'm not so worried about people doubting me. I, there's really nothing I can, uh, I can really, um, can't relate to that. And so I can't bring up those feelings and have them motivate me. Then you convincingly feel powerful by default, or at least neutral, which is sweet. Because then, probably some of you saw this coming, you transition into the capability frame. Now that you feel undoubtedly powerful, because not only did you avenge all of your shit, but now the shit left over that was doubting you, you fucked it up. Now you're the fucking king. Now you are not to be fucked with and you know it and now you're overqualified for this shit. It's a natural frame to fall into to feel capable. And the regular use of it will make you feel so goddamn powerful that confidence becomes your default state which again is amazing for you therapeutically. The gym, if you push yourself hard enough, can change you on the margins, at least as a person. And whatever deep-seated fears or doubts or insecurities you had from your childhood, teen years, middle school, whatever. Middle school is tough on everyone. And the people that's not tough on turn out to be total shit. Watch this. Hey, Scott's video guy, was middle school tough on you? Mm. See, he's a fucking total degenerate. His name is the video guy. What kind of name is that? So, it's super therapeutic for you to go through this because now you feel confident all the time. It's just great for your entire life. But now that you always feel like it, it might not be a psych up anymore. People are like, you got this. You're like, I know. I don't, I don't feel very aggressive. I just feel confident, which is cool. That's the kind of confidence that's good for like, I don't know, talking to chicks or talking to dudes or whatever the fuck you're trying to pick up. You're not exactly trying to be aggressive at the bar. But if you're just low-key confident, it's dope. But no one is expecting you to pull 315 for a set of 18 deficit deadlifts. So that comes up, you have to be a little bit more than cool and confident if you want to use the psych. And that is when you can consider transitioning into the desire frame. I have a lot to say about this one because this is a lot of shit. Now that you're confident enough to clash swords with pain anytime, you've been fighting the pain and you're winning too. It's time for you to try to flip the script. Why are you fighting the pain? And this is deeply philosophical. Pain is the very thing. It's the canary in the coal mine that tells you you're growing. Why fight it? One thing that uh, Jared Feather, IFB Pro, and I say to people who train with us on our YouTube channel when you know they're getting ready for a tough set is, listen, there's going to be pain here, but you want the pain. More pain is better. And when we can see them wincing underneath the leg press, we're like, yes, 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 this is it. This is what you want. If you're running from pain, training is going to be a real bad time because you can just leave the gym and never fucking get hurt again. But if you want to be there for the pain, a magical, magical thing can happen. The alignment of what you should be doing and what is actually happening is a beautiful thing. The reframing is tough. It can take a long time. It can take a lot of experiments that go south. You're like, I want the pain. Ugh, no, JK, fuck that. Rack the weight. But maybe you get a little bit further into winding the pain every single time. Visualization-wise, something you can do for five minutes before a training session in order to frame wanting the pain, you have to feel like you're yearning for it. You want to embrace it. You don't want to be guarded. And the thing is, pain makes you feel guarded, but you don't want to be guarded. Imagine yourself jumping off of a thousand foot tall skyscraper straight into a thousand foot deep pool of nothing but pitch black oil and the oil, like oil oil from the fucking Middle East made of pure intramuscular pain. You've jumped off the skyscraper into this endless vat of fucking terrible pain. Open your eyes when you're in that oil, a hundred feet deep. <sighs> Open your nose and mouth. See it. I want to see the fucking oil. Breathe it in. Let it in. Let all of the pain in. It's good, remember? Don't run away. Don't swim out. Don't come up for air. I mean, literally, you should be breathing during your sets, but you probably won't forget to do that. Another way to think of it is pain is like $100 bills falling from the sky. You got to grab as many of them as you can. You hope the rain of pain becomes more intense. There's some more hundies for you to go spend at the strip club later, whatever people do with $100 bills. Scott, uh, video guy, what, uh, what size bills do you take at the strip club? Are we talking about ones or are we talking about hundreds? You use hundreds to do lines of code. 
And then the bitches see you do that. They try to strip for you, and you're like, here's 50 cents, bitch. You ever throw a penny at? Never mind. This is just going to get. <laughs> Bling. JK, we're all sex positive on this channel. I'm sure you guys know that. Here's the thing. This shit that I just talked about is not something most people can do on a first try or a hundredth try or ever because evolution designed you to recoil from pain. The pain literally is the thing that says don't. This, whatever this is, is not the right answer. You have to flip the script and say, yes, it is the right answer. It's really tough. But if you practice embracing it, you could have hacked the system. And then getting psyched for the pain is easy because the pain is always there for you. A second or two of reframing and reminding away. You do that 14th rep of hack squats and your quads feel like they're tearing. Yes, 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 yes. I want more again. Don't fucking let me leave here until I'm dead. I want all the pain this exercise has to offer. Holy shit. The exercise is like, well, good news. We got a fucking sale on pain and it's free. Every time you do a rep, you get more pain. It's always there for you. Sometimes we're like, okay, I got to feel confident. I don't know. The squat's heavy and it's crushing you. You can't feel confident. You got to think of revenge from childhood. You're like, I don't even know. I remember how those people's faces look, man. But if pain is the thing that draws you into trying really hard, holy shit, you got a self-solving problem. It's like a guided missile with a huge radar reflection. There it is. Boom. Easy. Oh, oops, I did that by accident. You're no longer pushing yourself. You're being pulled in. There's no resistance. There's just a magnet of pain pulling you in and you want to be there. It's fucking awesome. If you can get to this point, you can massively reduce the fatigue of psyching up psychologically. Definitely compared to negative framing and even to capability framing because psyching up to push yourself means there is a resistance against which you push. But if you, and I'm not saying this is easy to do, if you rethink of pain as the pull, you open yourself to it and it pulls you in. You don't have to psych up for it anymore. And you don't even feel that exhausted psychologically after because it feels more therapeutic than anything. You got exactly what you wanted and there's more of it anytime you want. If you do this for long enough and you work on it, you go a little bit further each time and you really pay attention, this can be a transformative meditative experience for you. It, it has been for me 100%. Along with my sitting meditation practice, along with my working meditation practice, this going in and accepting the pain and wanting more of it practice in the gym has matured my perspective on existence, personally in my own head, in ways that are really quite honestly difficult to put into words. And I'm a fucking talking ass motherfucker. I can put some shit into words. This is tough. It can take you beyond fear of getting hurt in a set, beyond the hope that you'll do well in the set, beyond the suffering you're experiencing, suffering is the recoil away from pain, and into just elation and a preview of what they call in meditation the great silence. Because after your last set of the day, if you've given in to the pain and let it guide you, when you sit there in the gym, probably on the gym floor, probably having shat yourself and sweat everywhere, drinking your shake, you can no longer experience your ego. If you give yourself fully away to pain, remember your ego is there in large part to protect your identity from pain. If you just let it melt, there's no ego anymore. Like, fuck it, fuck it, take me away. I want the pain. You don't have much of an ego after that. And it could last for a few seconds. It could last for a few minutes. It could hang in there and last as a much smaller ego for a long time. And that is truly transformative and truly therapeutic. And if you guys want more of this type of shit, uh, these kind of fucking uh, deep dive psychological bullshit, let me know in the comments. Uh, maybe this is just not up your alley. No big deal. Now. The psyching up bullshit, a lot to say, a lot of good strategies, blah, blah, blah. How do you know if it's working for you? You want to try it and you want to say, is it working for me or not? Like I said to you guys earlier, I don't really psych up in the gym much anymore because 99 problems, but a stimulus isn't one. Recovery is my big uh, limiting factor. And so like I have no problem training hard enough to get all the gains that I need within my ability to recover. And if I train harder, I just wouldn't be able to recover. And I'd be like, great, I psyched up for no fucking reason to shoot myself in the foot. But you may be in the... Uh, in the camp where yeah, recovery really isn't a top end for you. And yeah, trying hard is something you could focus on. How do you know if psyching up is something that works for you? Well, after you've been doing it for a while, has it seemed to make your final set or final weeks of training better in performance? Because if it's not improving your performance, there's literally no point in doing it. But most people say, yeah, of course, I did better with it. Awesome. Next, 
is the fatigue that is added not overwhelming to recovery. Because like if you go ultra hard on that last set of leg press on that last Saturday before you take a week off or take a week of deload, and after that set, you're like crying, literally like crying tears of like existential angst or whatever. You had some kind of breakthrough and then you get like the flu right after because not only were you crying, but your immune system was like, dude, holy shit, like finishing a marathon and hitting the world record. Something like a large fraction of marathon owners actually just get sick the week after because the immune system is like, dude, I can't put up with this shit. If that's your story, then uh, too much, too overwhelming to recovery. But if you feel great, get you a last couple reps, you don't really feel a ton of recovery impact in that week after. Hey, maybe it works. The big arbiter is have you seen more long term months of progress and lifts with good technique? Like, if it seems like, hey, psyching up every now and again really keeps the progressions going, awesome. If it seems like it has nothing to do with it, well, then the, you're spending a lot of psychic energy for no good goddamn reason at all. And lastly, and very importantly, do you like the process of training more than you did before you started psyching up? If you used to not psych up or psyched up kind of the wrong way and now you're psyching up at all or the right way, do you like the shit more? Because sometimes people like psyching up and man, they're fucking there for it. Sometimes people don't. And then you tell them psych up and they're like, okay, what's the upside? You're like, oh, maybe a little bit more muscle growth. You could just do another regular set. And they're like, oh, they try it. They hate it. They say, fuck that. And that's just not a thing. A high fraction of the best bodybuilders in the world really just don't psych up, not in any serious way. And so there's not a thing where I can tell you a story about psyching up is definitely a thing that's going to take you to the next level. It can a little bit if you have the right mindset for it. But if you have the right mindset for it, that usually just means you're like more fucked to the head and you need more therapy. It's not even a compliment. So it's not like, yeah, man, you still don't have what it takes to get psyched up. Like, nah, if you can get psyched up, you're probably missing a few screws like me and a lot of you assholes that watch the channel, I'm sure. But if you like the process, hey, then fucking dope. So if you check all these checkboxes, amazing. If you don't, yeah, maybe psyching up's not for you and it's no big deal. So lastly, finishing it all up. If you're a beginner and you're watching this video, don't psych up. Your number one job as a beginner is to practice good technique until you feel athletic with it, which means it's ingrained and you do it anyway, whether or not you're hurting, whether or not you forgot how to do good technique, you're always doing good technique. That's your number one thing as a beginner and you're gonna get amazing gains anyway just doing that. If you're an intermediate, once you have stable technique with a high degree of general arousal, just fucking trying hard, not psyching up like crazy, you can experiment with some negative and positive arousal in the last few reps of your last few sets in a session or sessions in a mesocycle and see if it works for you. If you are advanced, see if you even get much out of arousal or if that's a limiting factor for you. If it's not, then fuck it because it's extra fatigue for maybe no good goddamn reason at all. If you do get something out of it, give some thought to walking naturally as you feel that it's time for the next transition from revenge to doubt. And if you're advanced, you might have already gotten over revenge and doubt, but maybe not, to capability and then to desire. And it might be very interesting for you to make that journey and very therapeutic. And it gets jacked along the way. You see, guys, what other therapist can promise you that you'll get jacked along with the therapy? Only me. And the best part, I'm not even a therapist. I'm just some fucking crazy dude on the internet who's trained too goddamn hard. And now all the screws are too loose. Anyway, just got the video, guy. You got some smart ass shit to say? We goddamn perfect childhood. Camera's about to die. So Camera's about to die. See you guys next time. Bye. Bye.